toolboxes at home have hammers and nails and screwdrivers and wrenches and all sorts of stuff, right? And you know what those things all look like in tape measures. But in school, you need a toolbox too. And this is where you keep your tools. And well, let's name some of those tools that are in your toolbox. You have, somebody mentioned glue sticks. What else? Say again? Gidgets and gadgets. Gidgets and gadgets. OK, that's a good thing. What about you, May? Do you got paper in here? Do you keep a paper in here? Like writing paper? OK. How many of you keep like a, a, a binder, a loose leaf binder? Or a notebook? Or Okay, coloring stuff. All right, so you have crayons maybe in there and lots of things that will help you to do the important work that you are doing in school. Now, I'm going to tell you something that I have often said to my son, and it is this. When you go to school, that is your job, okay? Moms and dads go to work and they go to jobs, right? Okay, but your job is to go to school. And the same... Okay, yes, he has the farm. Need a, need mm -hmm. need a school folder. Yes, a school folder, folder. All right. But the point is this, all right? We keep getting distracted here. Okay, but that's all right. That's that's all right. But my daddy has a lot of connections. Yes, that's right. So everybody has tools to do their job. Your tools are in this. And you are going to have and do your job as with the best of your ability in the same way that all of us have to do our jobs, right? So that's your work. You get up every morning, like all of the rest of the folks get up in the morning and go to work and do your job. So with that in mind, and why is it that you have to go to school and do your job? Because, not just because you have to, but because you are growing and becoming an important person in this world who will help to do kind and wonderful things. And that's what school is about, for you to learn and to grow and to be a helpful person in this world, okay? So that's why we're blessing backpacks, and it's a good thing to do because backpacks provide you with the tools to be God's special children. Let's bow our heads. Let's talk to God, okay? Thank you, God, for giving us the things that we need to learn. Thank you for your word that helps us to know that you love us and help us to be good students, kind students, and kind people in this world. Amen. Thank you very much. And, and you'll be coming up later to bring these backpacks, right? Right? Yes. Okay. Just want to make sure we're clear. Okay? Thank you all very much. Lots of sharing today. All right. Doesn't it just make your heart glad to see those, those kids just run up and down that aisle? It just makes me happy. I hope it makes you happy too. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Son Andrew comes bounding down the steps from his bedroom and begins this way. Mom, I need a really, 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 really big favor. Well, we kicked that door wide open, didn't we? Now, experience has taught me that I'm in big trouble. It's true. Does he want to go somewhere? Does he want to do something that I cannot accommodate in the moment? How much of a fuss is he going to make if I say no? Notice I didn't say if. I said when I say no. Is it about me spending money? Chances are pretty good that might be the case. Does he think, to be even more specific, does he think that he needs yet one more pair of shoes? <laughs> now trust me on this score, Imelda Marcos cannot hold a candle to this kid when it comes to shoes. 
He collects them more than she ever would, I'm convinced, okay? So the general place that I begin with this very emphatic question or request, as it were, is this. What's it going to cost? What's it going to take out of my time? So I'm always asking the what does this have an impact on me over, which sometimes puts me in a situation where I am ultimately put to shame. Not because my son intends to do so, but sometimes it just happens. And so it is that I am all the more ashamed when Andrew says, after the really, 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 really big favor, he says, I have a friend who I'd like to have come over for dinner tonight. Both of her parents are working, and she doesn't want to stay home by herself all alone. <sighs> then I feel like a schmuck. Truly, this man-child of ours, and that's really the best way to describe him, the same one who comes across as being aloof and uninvolved and not at all tuned in to what's going on around him, this young man shows us yet once more just how much he lives not only in his head, but in his heart. He cares deeply, enough so that he insists on bringing his parents along on the mission of his own development, the mission of the moment. Now that's an important word to bear in mind today, mission, because we use the word to describe usually some epic event or some epic larger than life endeavor. In truth, mission does not have to be a masterpiece of care and purpose worthy of some broad brushstroke publicity. Mission is found mostly in the little things. A word, an act of kindness, a prayer for someone, a request. The Apostle Paul, this is no surprise, the Apostle Paul is a mission-driven servant of the Church of Jesus Christ. No argument there from any of us. Of all of the letters written to the churches that he labored to establish, there is none so dear and so unusual and in the end so shrewd than this little letter that we find tucked into the New Testament, a letter that is addressed to a man named Philemon. Paul takes up a very specific matter with Philemon, and it is as mission-driven as any other work that he has done. It just feels smaller, and it sounds smaller to us. A couple of things to note. The name Philemon in Greek means loving or affectionate. It's as good as it gets as a foundation for Christian discipleship. Philemon had a servant who was named Onesimus. And that name means beneficial or useful. And so you see the names are descriptive of the relationship that we discover in this letter that is one of between master and servant. So here's the back story. Given the content of this letter, it would seem that Paul counts on the reliability of those definitions in the names. He expects Philemon to be loving, to demonstrate the qualities of kindness and affection, not so much toward Paul, but to Onesimus, who has been Philemon's servant. The expectation seems to have been something of a tall order, given that Onesimus, a servant and beholden to his master, has run away. 
Paul offers no explanation as to why that would happen. The communication is between Paul and Philemon, and both men presumably know what the details are. What he does say is this. The beneficial one, that would be Onesimus, had most recently been of benefit to the apostle Paul. He had come to Paul and had been of great help to Paul during Paul's imprisonment. And with that in mind, Paul, who understands the backstory, writes to Philemon to ask of him a really, really, really big favor. Do you know what I mean when I talk about or use the term triangling? Do you know what I mean by that? I know it has lots of definitions. It is a relationship configuration, okay? Imagine that in your mind's eye, in which person A, up here, doesn't have to be up here, but for the sake of the argument, person A and person B, for whatever reasons, find themselves in disagreement. It could be over a big matter. It could be over something as simple and perhaps also as inane as what color of toilet paper to purchase for the church, okay? No, seriously, folks, I have seen church arguments that are of a more minuscule nature than even that, okay? It happens. So person A and person B disagree. They can't work this out. And so person A then reaches out to person C and tells him all about his discomfort, all about his anger, all about his annoyance. What person A does not know, however, is that person B has also gone to person C, so that C is the one who is getting all of this information and both sides of the argument. Communication triangles really are neither good nor bad. They don't have a moral construct to them because sometimes, in fact, when we have those disagreements, we need that third party to sort of stabilize the conversation, the anger, or even the anxiety between the two primary communicators. But it can get ugly when there is an instance or an insistence on the part of both A and B to keep pulling everybody beyond person C into the conflict and one that hardly ever gets resolved. So in this instance, Paul is person C in the triangle. And so he does try very hard to restore some stability in this relationship between Onesimus and Philemon. It may be a bit daunting to understand the particularities behind the tensions between Philemon and Onesimus, uh, the relationship between a master and a slave, because in that world, we don't understand that in this world, but in that world, a runaway slave had reason to fear for his life, and a master had every reason to exact punishment for the transgression. But Paul recognizes the usefulness of Onesimus and how that supersedes his station in life. He looks upon him as a brother. The gospel has changed Paul. And because of that transformation, Paul's perspective on Christian unity, as it relates to mission, where the distinctions between Jew and Greek, male and female, slave and free, have been erased for the sake of the unity in Christ and also for the sake of mission, that perspective, that transformation, opens the door to make Onesimus a full-fledged partner with Paul in Paul's mission work. No longer a servant, a brother, an equal. And if the gospel transforms, which we certainly say that it does, if it creates new paradigms, new ways of thinking about relationships and roles and community, then the same gospel can make space for reconciliation between a grace-filled Philemon and a helpful 
Onesimus. And that is precisely what Paul does. He creates a pathway for that reconciliation to take place. Now, I can't preach on this text without making mention of Paul's modest manipulation of Philemon. I mean, you go back over and you look at the text a little bit. Paul promises in this, these short 21 verses, he promises to repay Philemon for any wrongdoing or any hardship due Onesimus while Onesimus is gone. But then Paul gently, maybe not so gently, nudges Philemon to remember that he owes Paul his very life. And it's real slick how this gets tucked in under the radar. He says, I say nothing about your owing me even your own self. I'm loath to mention it, Paul seems to say, but I'll do it anyway. And it is a shrewdness on Paul's part to just simply raise that issue for Philemon's attention. And it is a big thing that Paul asks of Philemon. But there is no measure of brokenness. There is no transgression. There is no fear nor hindrance that is bigger than God's grace. In other ways, and throughout his letters recorded in the New Testament, Paul is a man very much ahead of his time. But in this, perhaps more than others, Paul steps way beyond the worldview of his time to say that there are no servants, there are no masters. Neither are found in the new life ushered in by Christ. There is only affection and self-giving, self-emptying love. And love put to the best use possible in furthering and sharing the word of life. You know, we come here week after week through worship and prayer in the experience of Christian community believing. We come here believing that the word will keep changing us. That transformation is not contingent on our mood. It is not contingent upon our emotion for the moment or even any of our whims and wishes. The word creeps into our hearts without our even noticing it sometimes. The you that walked through those doors a few moments ago will not be the same you that will walk back out of those doors. You will have changed. And it is the gospel that does the changing. Good news always changes us. It may not always sound like good news to us. There is that wonderful adage where people say that the gospel will comfort the afflicted, but it will also afflict the comfortable. And that's true. Gospel as good news is not always the same as happy news. And it may in fact rattle around in our hearts to disturb us, to call us to accounts, to challenge us, and ask of us the favor that we may at times seem that it is impossible for us to grant. But in the end, we turn toward the word of life and we say yes. The favor is not self-serving. As many times as we turn to God in prayer, as many times as we ask of God the thing that is for the benefit of someone else, it all begins with God's call to us. To love as we have first been loved. It's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. But it does cost something. Anytime we follow Christ, anytime we follow in his footsteps, we are following him to the cross. But through self-emptying love, we are always born anew. In God's call, through Christ Jesus, we are changed for good.